Tom. Let us know what's going on. This is our introductory ed- edition. You guys have seen posts throughout the, the last year, or last year, excuse me, last month or so about uh, trying to create a conversation about some of the things going on with the fire service here in Wisconsin. And um, this is going to be a little bit of a learning process. Hopefully with everyone we do, we'll get better. But tonight we're going to talk about COVID-19. And I've got uh, three professionals from from around the state joining me this evening. I've got Joe, Chief Joe Pfaff from Stoddard Fire Department, which is over in the La Crosse area. I've got Keith Robert from Barnerville Fire and Iowa County Emergency Management uh, down kind of in the southwestern corner of the state. And then I got Mike Bernard from uh, Arbor Vita Fire and Rescue up in the Manaqua area. Um, so we're covering three different uh, segments. Um, of course, I'm from here in uh, the great city of Monroe, Wisconsin, home of Cheese Days, which unfortunately was canceled this year. But uh, the good news is uh, they're going to they're going to go next year with it, and then they're going to follow up and go in the following year to get back on track because it's always on the even year. So we're going to get uh, two years straight. So that should be good for our waistlines for sure. Um, <laughs> Coming up, just a couple of quick things. A lot of things happen in Extreme FD right now. Uh, you've heard me talk. I'm revitalizing the platform, trying to get more active, offer more classes. Um, so you're going to see the first class come out, be an announcement, that probably this weekend. I'm going to do a mini class, uh, 45 to 60 minutes, on tips and tricks for improving your training. Um, just some simple, very basic, simple things that I do on a regular basis. Um, that I found when, whenever you don't do them, your training doesn't go as well. So we'll sit down for an hour. Uh, that'll be free. Uh, that'll be live streamed as well. And you can click in and join it. There'll be a registration process. So if you register for it and you can't make the date, uh, we'll kick your recording that you can log in and catch it, uh, catch it later. If you don't register, you don't get to see it. So pretty simple. Um, we're going to get started here. Um, I think we'll start off with just uh, member attendance. And I want to talk in general, how is COVID affecting our membership attendance at, whether it be at training, um, up coming to calls, you know, are people scared to come to calls because they're afraid they may get COVID from, you know, if you're running EMS or lift assist or, or extrication calls, are you concerned about, you know, getting it from a patient? Are you concerned about getting it from uh, a, a fellow firefighter in the back of a truck? Um, maybe, maybe people are staying away for that reason, staying away from trainings for that reason. Um, so just in general, kind of what's going on with, with training and, and, and call attendance. I think I'll start with, start with you, Keith. Um, if you would let us, let us know how, if at all, it's affected you. Well, yeah, it, um, I probably bring even a stranger perspective to this as the emergency manager for the County. But, um, you know, when this thing first hit, uh, we, we held a quick meeting and we called an end to all training until we got a grasp of how to, how to respond to this. Um, the first thing we worked on was a decontamination procedure so that if we were paged to a, an EMS assist or something like that, that we would have a procedure at the station that we could put guys through to, uh, to get them deconned as best we could, put them in a fresh set of clothes and, and, and send them home, that kind of thing. So, we did that and we worked on procedures for deconning the trucks and uh, we obtained <coughs> PPE and we talked about PPE procedures on scene and that kind of thing. So we set a lot of things in place in the first couple of weeks of this. Um, but, you know, it was a learning process for all of us. It's a novel virus, so nobody really knew everything there was to know about it. So as we educated the department, um, some guys decided that um, it was better for them to stay away. They had uh, maybe... Um, dads or moms or close relatives that are taking cancer treatments or had other, uh, you know, other issues that they were close with that they didn't want to endanger. Uh, and we had those, we had those uh, uh, talks up front. And so uh, call volumes uh, or call response uh, really wasn't affected. Call numbers uh, for, wasn't affected so much because we had a, a good heads up and everybody kind of knew where everybody else stood. So uh, we've been okay you know, in that regard. We did go back to uh, small group trainings in the first part of May. And uh, so we took off about six weeks from meeting. We did have uh, virtual meetings, phone conferences pretty much at first, but it was, uh, it was, those were well attended. 
Uh, the group did want to keep informed, be kept informed of the uh, of the virus uh, in the county, and and uh, also wanted to be kept informed of other things that were affecting the fire department. So, um, but in May we did re uh, restart our small group trainings with uh, tried to keep them at six to eight members with a couple of officers to run the trainings, and then we set up scenarios, and it really concentrated on basic skills and just keeping their head in the game and keeping current skills. Uh, sharp and uh you know not getting too technical and not getting too carried away because we had limited people there so and we're still in that mode today uh, although we've expanded to uh, 10 people uh at a training and uh, a couple of officers then and then uh, you know we've been going from there so it's been going very well and uh, haven't lost anybody uh, everything's been going good uh, from that perspective keith what would you say from an attendant standpoint at these trainings, you know, kind of back to the basics to keep it clean and simple, uh, compared to what you would consider normal attendance, up or down, uh, down 20%, down 30, if down at all? I would say that I've got about uh, uh, a third of the department. So I would say about 33% of the department right now is not participating in the physical training. And that's uh, maybe partly due to, um, own physical or uh, ailments or more comorbidities that exist, um, or it could be because the someone in their household has that. Sure, yep. makes sense. Mike, would you you got anything to add to that? Anything different that you're experiencing or unique? So um, initially, we did start with the uh, um, virtual meetings. Um, everybody could call in. We were doing Zoom meetings. Um, kind of was our first response to it, but then our command staff took a proactive step forward and established uh, kind of like Keith was talking about some small group trainings. Uh, what we were able to do with our training committee and our training officers is we were able to um, sit down and look at our schedule. We try to pre-schedule all of our fire trainings as far out as we can so that everybody has an idea what's going to be coming up. We try to leave the hose testing a little bit more quieter so it's more of a surprise and you get more people to show up. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, no, we, uh, so like we had normal extrication training. Um, we kind of just went back to the basics, uh, did very simple things with smaller groups focused on things like stabilization, just simple cuts. Um, two groups would get together so they would be able to work together. Um, uh, each group was only probably five or six people. And we stuck with that for a little while. We've since gone back to full department trainings. Um, so the way that it breaks down is we have our uh, main business meeting. Anybody who wants to attend virtually still uh, was given that option. Um, we've pretty much had everybody go back to coming to in-person meetings, but we do all of our social distancing, pull all of our vehicles out of the apparatus floor and uh, space all of our chairs out, makes it easy for decon afterwards. And then um, uh, we have our EMS meeting uh, the next Monday, uh, which is uh, EMS training, rescue training, um, that went back to normal. Our fire trainings are the next Monday. We went back to normal on those. What we tend to set up as far as our rescue trainings and our fire trainings is we do um, one large thesis or one large idea for the training, but then we break off into groups. So inherently it's smaller groups as it is, and it's not like we have the entire department gathered around one person doing just one thing. So if we're doing like pumping, uh, this past month we did relay pumping. So we have multiple stations going on at the same time and we kind of get people moving through different stations with that. Um, we have an opportunity for people to get used to driving the different vehicles or some of our vehicles are manual versus automatic. So um, getting people used to that. With our uh, EMS and rescue training, um, I oversee those trainings. So um, what I was able to do is set up different uh, scenarios where we could um, space people out uh, check off on some of our advanced skills. So have like an airway station set up, have uh, different medical scenarios set up, have spinal immobilization set up. Everybody was spaced out. It was an individual one-on-one -on -one basis and we could just rotate through the whole group. So everybody was kind of doing something, which was nice. Um, and then at the end of the month, we have a maintenance meeting. So we go through all of our vehicles, check our medical equipment, run everything. And uh, we still have our command staff meeting uh, after that. Um, Beyond that, uh, we were able to uh, make one of the SCBA sprayers. 
So we were able to take uh, one of the paint can sprayers and hook that up to our SCBA. And we have this uh, really nice disinfectant that we were able to pick up. And uh, I think it's got like a 10 minute kill time on everything uh, that you could think of. So after any of our meetings, we walk through with that, spray everything down. Um, and we switch now to um, any of our calls. Uh, we physically go back to the station. If we respond in an apparatus or if it's a medical call and we respond in a personal vehicle, everybody uh, takes turns getting sprayed down head to toe. And then uh, we spray down all of our apparatus and vehicles, uh, let everything sit for that 10 minute kill time with everything closed, open it back up, gives you time to do paperwork and things like that. And um, it's pretty much been kind of getting back to business as normal. Um, there are some people who are hesitant. I wouldn't necessarily say we've seen a drop in any type of attendance uh, with our calls or trainings. It's pretty much normal. So we've had good active participation and uh, we try to put a high emphasis with our training and uh, meetings and calls. So um, through our SOPs, we actually hold our members uh, to uh, a standard, uh, making sure that uh, we see them a certain amount of times a month. And anybody who's had a problem with that or just usually not been physically able to do it or has any other concerns, just good communication with the command staff. Um, we were able to put together groups for more of accountability. So an officer is given five or six members and that's kind of your chain of command. So you can report directly to your officer and then uh, they can run it up the chain as far as if somebody's going to miss something or if they have anything else special that would be a health consideration or anything with COVID. And we communicate that through our safety officer, our infection control as well. Super. Wow. You're doing a lot of stuff up there. Tell us um, how many active members do you have on your department up there? Our roster's uh, right around 40. Um, as far as our training goes, um, we're probably going to see at least 30 people. Um, it, it, we get really good active participation with it. Uh, but like I said, you know, the big thing for us is that we have that accountability level. Our uh, command staff and our chiefs do a really, really good job of uh, holding people accountable, putting a large emphasis on training, making sure people are getting to meetings, stay updated on stuff. So our members really have that want and desire to come to trainings, not only to potentially learn new things, but just uh, stay up to date on stuff. You know, we kind of with um, the recommendations from the state and everything else, we do the round robin every year. So whether we're doing emergency vehicle driving or pumping or SCBA training, we um, just made a new SCBA trailer maze uh, out of an old semi trailer. Um, so we're always checking off on stuff. We're always doing stuff. And, uh, especially with the medical world, with all the rescue and EMS people that we have. It's, uh, it's a never-ending battle, as everybody knows, to stay up on your skill set and make sure that you're checking off on stuff annually. But I, I think the biggest thing for us is we get good attendance because we hold people accountable to it. That's great. Well, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole on accountability, but <laughs> um, uh, it sounds like a really good topic for another roll call that we'll do because I'm sure there are many people out there asking the Tell me how the hell you're getting away with that. But uh, yep. we're going we're gonna to leave that as a teaser and segue into that in a month or so. Um, Sounds good. <laughs> Joe, um, what can you add, to, uh, if anything, to, to what's going on? You do anything different up, up there uh, in Stoddard? Well, uh, you know, one thing that we, we definitely saw when this thing first broke out, there was a lot of what ifs and all of that type of, of information. And the first thing that we did, you know, as leadership, we sat down and we started talking with each other and said, okay, what stuff do we follow and what's the best process? And we, we, we all established that, you know, following CDC, following um, WHO, and then also talking to our medical director on a regular basis, we found that like everybody, things were changing on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, what we ended up, we first started off with uh, uh, communication with the rest of the group in uh, just texting, emailing, and keeping communication on a day-to-day -day basis, just, here's the new protocols, here's the new things that are being established and whatever. And kind of when the, the dust started to settle, um, you know, and we started getting good protocols established, um, that's when, you know, people were starting to become a little bit more fearful of all the things that were coming out and the, the information and such. And, and we really broke down and said, you know, we got to really take a good hard look at what we're doing and we need to trust our leadership at the medical facilities, at, at, uh, um, at the CDC and whatnot, and, and understand that what they're giving us, we need to follow. 
So when it comes down to masking, when it comes down to deconning, what are the rules that we need to follow? You know, not getting hung up on the, uh, the, uh, the sales speeches per se that are out there and such. And really that helped us make a very clean path to, to all of the steps that came, came into play, similar to what uh, Keith and Mike have talked about already. Um, you know, establishing decon areas, you know, and uh, those types of things. Um, but, but more than anything, you know, letting people know that their PPE is critical. It, we aren't going to go into a structure fire without turnout gear on. We're not going to go in without an SCBA on. We shouldn't be going in without a mask on. We shouldn't be going in without eye protection or gowns or any of the other stuff that's established. And how important is cleanup? Cancer, the cancer push has definitely told us that we need to make sure we have a clean turnouts. Same, same. We need to make sure that we're deconning our, our bags, our gloves, our trucks, and everything to that effect. So we really did the big push on trust your PPE. And then know that by, do, by trusting your PPE, you're able to go home and be safe with your families and such and, and whatnot. So, so that, was, that was pretty much the biggest thing as far as our roles. You know, as far as number of calls that were taking place, we did notice a big decrease in calls. Um, we probably dropped about 50% in calls, but every call that we went on was a real emergency. People were not calling because they had a hangnail anymore. They were calling because they were in cardiac arrest or they're calling for, for respiratory issues, you know? Um, so it really put everybody at a, a much higher uh, response, you know, when we were getting paged out for stuff. And that was, that was not just our, our area. That was even listening to whatever was going on in the county and the regional areas around us. Um, as far as number of people that were responding, <laughs> most of us were stuck at home. So our call vo or our number of people that were responding actually went up a little bit, you know, uh, to individuals that were stuck at work for a late shift or something to that effect didn't happen. They were still at home. So that was kind of a bonus for us uh, just for the fact that, you know, um, so many people were working from home. Um, there were definitely some individuals that, you know, still were going to the the day-to-day -day job. Um, but uh, for us, you know, business was normal for, for us as, as always. Um, Getting into some of the things that uh, you guys were discussing as far as training. Um, one thing that we first started out with is we definitely did the spacing. Like Mike stated, you know, we pulled our apparatus out of, this, out of the station. We'd separate out tables. We'd measure out the six feet, keep everybody at a distance, mask up as much as, I mean, keep our social distancing and such. And um, when we first started out, we were trying to stay away from like hands-on activities per se, trying to keep ourselves spaced up a little bit more. So we did a little bit more on the video training. Um, you know, we were catching up on some different medical stuff that was coming in. We did a lot of pipeline stuff as far as what the CDC was pushing for uh, COVID and all, uh, and educating our, our individuals on that type of stuff. Um, you know, and then, but the thing was, is that we found in a very short order, the firefighters and EMS professionals were coming back and we're like, we need our hands on this equipment. How can we do this? We, we want, we come down here to train and we want to train. We don't want to be sitting here watching videos. And, you know, I kind of, <laughs> one side of me was like, Ooh, that's kind of rough. That's a bad spot to be stepping. But then the other side of me was like, you know what? These guys know what the dangers are and they want to get better, better job or better at their job. We need to get them what they can do. So what we came up with is we have uh um, our department has a foundation, which is it's like an auxiliary uh, and individuals that are in the community that have special things that they can do, but they're not interested in going into the emergencies and whatnot. So what we ended up coming up with was our, our leadership sat down and we said, you know, to be effective and efficient at calls, the leadership needs to know what the troops can do, what their capabilities are. But on top of that, with the volunteer, because we don't know who's going to be where, the volunteers and the firefighters and everybody else needs to know how effective all the other firefighters are also. And one thing that we've always done with, with training was it forced us, or what we always tried doing was other people were able to observe other co-members and see what their effectiveness was. Well, if we were going to be breaking up in these smaller groups, we weren't going to be able to do that. You know, the group would, of six, uh, we would just keep engine companies together that group of six could only do what and know what that group of six was doing. So what we ended up doing was we came up with our, our foundation would follow each one of these pods around. So each night we'd do like a, a 45 minute 
station and we'd divide up into two, three, four groups, depending upon what we had for tasks that we wanted to accomplish. And we'd video them. And the reason we would video them was for two parts. Number one, the firefighters could see themselves in action. And number two, uh, the other firefighters could see the other groups and say, wow, Jones over there, do you see how fast he could move that ladder? You know, or, or whatever, you know, the tasks themselves were. So it was a good chance for us to, even though we have, um, we had to break up into groups, we're working in smaller groups, we got different PPE on, we still kept the quality of the training up there and we're still keeping that knowledge flowing back and forth amongst the leadership, amongst the firefighters, amongst the EMS crew, so. That's, uh, no, that's great information, guys. I got, uh, just before we segue into the next uh, question, no, I, I, I want to ask a couple things. Um, there's a big difference, even, even amongst just the group here, there's, there's somewhat of a difference in the D decon and the approach to decon. And I, I can't watch every website every CDC bulletin, every state chief's bulletin. So, so help me out here. Um, there was a, uh, what I felt was a mad rush when COVID hit to mm -hmm. suddenly wipe everything down. Uh, I mean, you, there was stuff out there with SEBAs being able to be bug sprayers and infrared lights and, and all this. I mean, I mean, it was, it, it's amazing what firefighters can come up with with a little time on their hands. Um, but I never really saw anything saying that that's what we should do. It was, I, I almost felt like it was, we were doing it because somebody else was doing it or we saw somebody else doing it, or it felt like the thing we should be doing. I never really saw any formal documentation that said, you should do this. This is a recommended chemical. This is the duration. And in fact, within probably 30 days, maybe six weeks, it come out that the virus doesn't live very long on surfaces. So real briefly, you know, a minute, minute and a half or less. Uh, and I, and I'll, I'll start with you, Mike, just because you guys are really doing some great stuff and a lot of it. How did you make that? How, or why did you make the decision to go down that road and knowing what you know today with all the, you know, we learn this stuff every day. Are you continuing to do that? And if so, why? So our primary reason to start out with that is we were able to find, um, I don't have the exact uh, chemical that we use in front of me, but we were able to find this stuff. And it's not necessarily just saying that we're limiting it to COVID. Um, we're kind of doing it as a broad base of things. And realistically with the kill time that we're doing it and how we're trying to decon our equipment is not necessarily just going to be a COVID scare type of thing. Uh, it initially started out as that, and that's how we're trying to decon everything just to make sure not only our surfaces are clean, but again, with going into the houses and everything, we're trying to decon a little bit more um, uh, coming from those houses. The reason that we're sticking with it too is that I guess there's a lot of uncertainty for us up here because our tourist base that we see is just, it's so huge. It's, it, you can't even fathom what you're dealing with on some occasions. And we have this, um, kind of this new trend where people come up here from let's say Milwaukee or Chicago or wherever they're coming from and they come to our ER and they get checked out and that's where they test positive for COVID. So, you know, it's hard enough to get somebody with hepatitis or AIDS to tell you that they have it on your, you know, history check on people. And all of a sudden, 20 minutes later, it's like, Oh, why are you have liver fit? Oh, you have this great. Now we're already 20 minutes into this and we're starting to think about, you know, BSI protocols, to even a higher level. So, you know, our big thing that we're looking at is that, you know, to go with what Joe and Keith were saying, goggles, gowns, masks, everything, you know, proper PPE and everything. We're just kind of taking that little extra step just as a more of a cautious side of things, just to make sure that we're doing right by the membership and just taking that extra step just to make sure that we're going above and beyond until we have rock solid information that, you know, yes or no. And, and that's the big thing we're looking at. That's a great answer. Um, I'll tell you what my gut tells me when I hear you, when I hear you respond like that, and a lot of people probably won't like hearing this is that it sounds to me like the fire service is about 25 years behind on BSI. 
that uh, because we because we weren't transporting patients, uh, and our and our interaction was in a different element most of the time, not all the time, but uh, uh, it sounds like uh, you know you go. It, I ran on ambulance for a number of years, so I understand the procedures when you when you transport a patient. We clean the ambulance every single time. Um, now I know that there are services that are doing much more cleaning than what they used to for many of the same reasons, but nonetheless, we always clean the rig, right? We, we, new sh we always sprayed the cot down, disinfected the cot, the countertops, touch services, blah, 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 right? Um, but yet I would go to a car accident as a firefighter, do extrication, be in or near or even assisting with the patient care. I never cleaned anything. Mm -hmm. Unless I visibly saw, you know, obviously if I had gross contamination or something on my uniform, I, I would. But as a general rule, 99.9% .9 of the time, what happens? We get done with the extrication or we get done with a car accident and we go. If we're wearing rubber gloves, they go in a red bag, usually in the back of the ambulance because we don't want to deal with the waste. And, you know, we, we jump in our fire truck in, in our gear and everything that we just had. And we go back and we hang our gear up and we wait for the next call, right? Um, I, th I think that that's... I don't think that's special in Monroe. I think that's in the fire service, right? So maybe what the fire service is and what we can all take away from, from that issue um, or that procedure is that in general, we possibly should be looking at how much are we doing? Have we gone too far with it? Because we all know the pendulum swings, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I, 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 it really struck me, Joe made a comment, uh, and it really hit home. In fact, I wrote it down as he said, we asked the question, what should we do? And, and, and I'm paraphrasing here, what should we do? And what does it look like? And I think at some point we have to, um, you know, I'll use the, the fire attack analogy, resetting the fire. At some point we have to reset COVID and we have to say, what have we done for the last fill in the blank months? What is working? What's not working? What are we what are we overkilling on? Meaning what are we doing that really is not providing a true effect other than maybe psychological? Uh, and, and what does the next six months go look like? Cause this thing ain't going away mm -hmm. um, at least not anytime soon. So that's kind of the reason I picked this topic was that, you know, what do we do going forward? At some point we got to stop reacting day by day and we got to start putting a plan together. that says, here's what we're going forward. Now. Yeah. We know that there's going to be uh, uh inserts it's a dynamic process and things are going to change and we will react to those but i love what joe was doing up there with let's have a plan and uh you know short of a catastrophe coming we should stay the course i mean that should be the plan and if a storm comes we'll divert around the storm you know um so that's great stuff guys one final question before we move on uh, a lot of technology training zoom meetings started in the beginning um i think keith started started off with with that to be honest so i'll come back to keith on this challenges any challenges with the membership and getting that to work yeah there's there's definitely some um you know realize in government uh electronic meeting platforms wasn't wasn't even a, a reality for most government agencies Prior to this, electronic meetings weren't legal. Uh, COVID made them legal, and uh, so from the from the aspect of a lot of us even having the technology prior to COVID, many of us didn't. Um, so we were kind of all, or many were forced into uh, learning this technology. And there's some I've got some members out there that just aren't going to do the video portion of this. You know, they don't mind calling in and do the phone portion. That's okay. Um, and I'll, and I'll live with that as long as I got their ear, you know, right. so uh, right. that's, uh, that's, what's important to me, but, um, you know, I don't, I don't expect to get a hundred percent that are going to be willing to log in and put themselves on screen. Yeah. So it's, it'll be a challenge. It'll be a challenge for a while going forward. It will be. I had, uh, <laughs> I had a chief I spoke to a couple of weeks ago and I was kind of telling him about the topic and what we were doing in that. And he laughed. He said, Al, he said, uh, Two weeks before COVID, I had members that I couldn't get to open an email, <laughs> and out of, and out of the blue, they're running family Zoom parties. He goes, "How how did that happen?" I said, "Well, 
the email was business and work and the zoom party was fun. That's the, exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. the difference. So, okay, let's move on guys. Uh, um, I'll start with Joe on this one. Recruitment. I want to talk just a little bit about recruitment in three, three specific areas. Uh, as they're related to COVID, specifically as they're related to COVID, any unexpected retirements or resignations, people just said, you know what, I'm not dealing with COVID, I'm not doing the front line, I'm out of here. Um, and then the opposite of that, any unexpected uh, knocks on the door saying, hey, I'm, I'm seeing all this on the news, uh, I want to help out. Um, I'll start off the first one. Uh, do any expected on reti retirements? Um, at this point, you know, what we've talked to our, our membership and we, we do have some individuals that are, are older. Um, they, there's concern that they don't want to, um, get themselves exposed to it and such. Um, and you know, I told our, our crew basically knows that at any point in time, if they don't feel comfortable with a scene or don't feel comfortable with the situation, they need to speak up and, and just not to respond. And as long as we know that that's where they're at, we're okay with that. Um, the, we, our membership is running about 26. Uh, when COVID first kicked in, we did have probably three individuals that called in and said, you know what, until this stuff blows over, we have a firm understanding of what's going on. We're going to lay back a little bit. And, uh, you know, knowing that that's uh, how things were going to take place, we kind of shuffle, reshuffled some of the cards around and ensured that their tasks and their responsibilities were covered by other individuals. And we just keep moving forward on it. Um, any retirements that are like, nope, I'm pulling the pin. I'm not, this isn't for me. Not at all. Uh, the reality is, is the people that are doing this job want to do this job until they can't get out of bed in the morning. And it's, it's, they're doing it to help other individuals. Um, and as long as they know that they're doing it in the safest manner fashion, I think we're good. Um, additional people come in and knocking on the door, not so much, you know, but it, there's not a, there's no, at no point in time is anybody like beating down the door anyway. The ones that are wanting to be there are there. And the ones uh, um, that are interested in doing it are, are, are showing up. So, I mean, we have, we have brought on three individuals uh, in during this disaster. And I'm going to place it as that. The part that I'm having the most problem with, honestly, is the education. Because here we have these people that want to get in, want to do, and uh, the technical college, which is our, our sole spot for getting education moving forward, um, they've had to shut the doors down due to everything that's out there. So it's, we've had to get a little bit on the creative side as far as keeping the interest of that individual while, you know, the, 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 the technical colleges are able to get themselves back on their feet so they can get the protocols in place so that it's safe for everybody to get back. Um, so, you know, that's, that's some of the challenges that are out there. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Mike, you got anything to add? Um, I, I would say that we didn't have anybody that wasn't already who were thinking about retiring or moving down from positions with normal elections or anything like that. There wasn't anything that abruptly changed with that. Um, we usually have a pretty good steady stream of people knocking on the door. Um, we're still taking in new members. Um, I would say we're at a point too where we're starting to have to build lockers and we're adding more, we've added more lockers around the station. Um, we're fortunate that our technical college started with some virtual stuff up here and they went back to hands-on. So um, they've been doing a good job on trying to get our newer people through. It's been taking a long time. And I guess to echo what Joe is saying, it's frustrating because you have these new people who walk in the door and they want to help and they want to be a part of it. And it's just like, well, did you finish your test? Nope, we didn't do the test yet. Nope, national registry isn't going yet. Nope, we can't do this yet. And it's been taking a while and it's hard to keep them going. But, you know, I, I think for us, the big thing in keeping trainings interested, trying to fold them in, in there as much as you can and make them feel like they're a part of the team. And you know what? If you've got new firefighters, get the firefighters out there doing the two minute drills. Get your senior guys out there working with these young guys, keeping them interested. Hey, see if you can beat me on two minute drills. You know, I'm old. Can you beat me? And, you know, for us, we have a lot of junior members. And, you know, the nice thing with those junior members is they're young and they want to beat you at stuff and they want to challenge. So, you know, that's kind of what we've seen. 
And, uh, you know, we're, we're pretty much at a normal for that. So I wouldn't say that we've seen any kind of downtake or uptake in any particular area uh, intentionally because of COVID. Okay. Keith, you got anything you want to throw in? No, I think uh, we're pretty similar to both, both Joe and Mike here. Um, we're at about a 37 is our roster maximum that we set for ourselves. And uh, we've had to expand that a couple of times in the last six months, about a 38, 39. And then uh, I just had a young gentleman join the Army, so he, uh, he decided he was pulling the plug. But, uh, I mean, that, those types of things happen. But for, for the most part, we're doing, we're doing really well. Good, good. Um, we're, I'll just throw in Monroe. Um, you guys are well aware, as my audience is well aware, recruitment's my art and passion um it battles right alongside training but it it takes the lead every time and we're doing some new stuff we actually I developed the plan last fall um to change up our recruiting and, and to expand it and we've done a lot of stuff um on social media and digital platforms that we've spent the last probably six months, five, five to six months putting together. We've, um, we partnered with a local marketing agency to help us. Um, we've developed uh, professional looking uh, digital content um, as well as um, videos they've done. They've videoed a lot of our trainings. Uh, we ran a lot of scenario based stuff. It wasn't cheap. I'll tell you that. Um, it's, we're going to see if it works. You know, when we went down the path and we started the process, COVID haven't hit, hadn't hit yet. Um, and we were just about waist high when it did hit. And we were at a point of go, no go uh, to throw a fire term in there, you know, where we, we were going to get it or we're not. And I rolled the dice and I said, chief, I think, I think we got it. We got to go. We got to go. We're too far in. Uh, we're too, we're pot committed at this point And we went forward. And the membership, for the most part, I think has had a lot of fun with it. So, I mean, a residual effect of, of what we've done is engagement morale to, to an extent. Um, and then, of course, anytime you train, you, you learn skills, right? Or, or if you don't learn new skills, you refresh old ones. Um, so that, those have all been benef you know, residual benef benefits of the process. But we're, we're days away. Um, next week, we're going to start launching a lot of that stuff on our, on our Facebook page, and um, we'll see. But our, our plan is to hire. We're going to do a marketing, two-month marketing launch, and we're hoping to hire, you know, crossing my fingers, six to nine people would be really, really nice, um, especially if the city uh, keeps it in our budget, which I think they will. Uh, the city's behind us and does a really good job of supporting us. So um, short of uh, 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 some real fear with revenue related to COVID, I think we'll be all right. But the question is, will people want to join in these uncertain times? Um, and, you know, they could be right on the fence, ready to join, maybe not ready to join. And will this or won't it affect it? I'm not sure I'll be able to measure that. Um, but I certainly wasn't expecting it be one of the challenges I would, I would face. So uh, I'll keep you guys abreast on that and, and how it works and how well it goes. But uh, I think, I think regardless, we had to do what we did. And in this business, um, you have to try new things and you have to try to reach your audience in in different ways. And, you know, it's, it's not, People say, well, it's not 1980 anymore. And I say, well, hell, it ain't 2015 anymore, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, this things don't change in years anymore. It's 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 days. So uh, by the hell, by the time this recording's done, Facebook might be obsolete. Might might there might be no place for the video. So um let's move on to the final topic, uh funding and expenses. And I was I was talking to you guys before we went on the air. Uh I th I think that the funding issue is going to affect everybody, um, career and volunteer both. It's going to affect them in different ways, but it's going to affect them nonetheless. When there's when there's less money in the pot, um, we as as departments get less money, and that affects things. And in career departments, it usually starts with staffing because 
95% of their budget is staffing. Uh, in volunteer departments, it usually involves equipment um, and things that may affect the, their ability to, to pay gas bills uh, for the trucks, uh, tires for the trucks, things like that. In the larger cities, they have bigger budgets so they can handle a little bit more of a hit and usually ride it. But in a lot of the volunteer departments, uh, m many of them, in fact, get little or no funding from the government entity that they support. Uh, a lot of them operate on fundraising, you know, if, if not entirely, you know, 70, 80 plus percent of, of their funding is, is from fundraising. So for the last three months, I've seen, unfortunately, cancellation after cancellation after cancellation of some, some events that have been going on for, for many, many years. And I think that there's money to ride through this year from last year's fundraising, but I'm concerned about how it may affect their ability next year. What happens next April when that money is run out? What happens next June when, you know, when that money is run out? But, it, but the, the new fundraising event hasn't yet happened. Um, a lot of these departments don't have rainy day funds. You know? They don't have you know, 50, 60,000 a year, two, three years worth of operating revenue sitting in a, in a mutual fund or, or a market, money market or something like that. They're running basically, uh, uh, as we'd say in, in, in our private lives, paycheck to paycheck. So I wanna talk about uh, the expenses in the sense of, have you incurred any significant additional expenses related to COVID? Um, and if so, what, what are those and do you see them going away? Um, and then the revenue side is, it, are, do you think you're gonna get, take a hit and how bad? Um, so uh, let's go, let's go with Joe. If you'd start us off on that, I'd appreciate it. Sure, sure. Um, so first off, I mean, when, when COVID originally hit, you know, it was uh, <clears throat> a mass blitz on, on all this different PPE that you had to, to acquire and, and different things that you were wearing and such. And, you know, one thing I, I kind of want to add too, as far as uh, how has, has COVID changed um, our response? Number one, I think it's forced us to do stuff that we were supposed to be doing a long time ago. And uh, wearing masks, wearing gloves to some of these calls should be a normal thing. It did look, make us look real quick though, as far as accessibility to this equipment, accessibility to the supplies that we needed and how the cost of that stuff just went right through the roof. Um, so, it, it, you know, the, the, the key behind a lot of this stuff is just making sure that you're looking at the short term and the long term and what the costs themselves are going to be. So, um, you know, we, we did go with a little bit more of the creative side um, as far as like our, our masks and such. We, instead of going with the N95s, um, we ended up using our SCBA masks and getting filters that were placed on the front of them. So that gives us the ability to recycle and reuse those. Our firefighters are comfortable at wearing them. We were fit tested with those all the time. We are noticing that the N95s, even though we were fit tested for them, um, all it took is one bump on the face and now you're, you've exposed yourself. This kind of goes back also to the make sure and trust your PPE and know that it's gonna protect you. Um, so that when you're showing up to a call and you know that you're gonna be asked to go into a situation that is lack of better terms, IDLH, um, and uh, that your equipment is going to protect. So we looked at all of the different things that we can do and change as far as reusability um, so that it <clears throat> saves us money in the long run. Um, and then as far as, you know, you're talking on uh, some of the fundraising and such, um, our foundation is the one that takes care of our fundraising, and we've had two events. Uh, both of them were canceled this year. Um, but, you know, the one thing I think that COVID has definitely done across the nation, and this doesn't have to do with just fire service, this has to do with every economic thing in America that goes back to rolling with the punches and coming up with a different solution. And I mean, we are experts at, at our jobs. And what we needed to do is we needed to come up with a better, different way of doing what we're doing. Um, you know, so, you know, we used to have an event, we had two events that, that entailed 500 plus people that were gathering up in one spot. As public servants, 
do you think that would have been a good idea to have that take place? Absolutely not. You know, that's the last thing that we want to have. So we, we forced the cancellation of those events, but we changed things up and, and made it more of an online type thing. So we have raffles that are going on where you don't even have to come to see the raffle. You can jump on the webpage. You can buy them through PayPal. We send you out different stuff. Our foundation has become extremely creative and rolled with the punches to make sure that these types of events are still able to keep going on. Are we missing the beat? Is, or are we missing the event itself? Yes, we are. Are we losing the funds on it? To be honest, it's uh, we are doing just as well on our, our event as we are on the fundraising itself. Again, one thing I, that we've often talked about is, you know, we need to put all of our time and our resources and our, our energies into training and serving. So that's where uh, our firefighters have been doing a knockdown job as far as keeping their training up and in responding to the calls. Our foundation has been doing a fabulous job as far as, uh, you know, trying to help out the, the firefighters themselves and keep those fundraisers moving forward on it. So um, was there anything else on that question you were asking? I'm sorry. No, 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 that's, you covered it. That's, that's great. Um, so if I understand correctly, you haven't, you haven't, or you don't anticipate taking really that much of a financial hit. You were just forced into going about gathering it a different way. Correct. And I mean that, you know, that's, that's with every business <clears throat> bars and restaurants aren't making it if they decide to close up, right. If they have online, if they're doing uh, curbside service, they're still in business. And that's, that's kind of one of the things that we need to make sure that we stay in service. So how do we, accommodate those types of, of uh, situations that are, are being laid in front of us. So, Mike, anything so, uh, expense wise? I mean, anything you're doing that, that, that you're taking a big hit from a new expense position and uh, how are you guys doing revenue wise? We, at the beginning of the year, <coughs> uh, just purchased all brand new SCBAs. So we made a full switch over and uh, we're very dependent on our annual fundraisers that we do to always offset the cost to the tax base. And we, as a fire department, paid for that without going to the tax base at all. So we had this large expense and then all of a sudden COVID happened. So to echo again, what Joe was saying, you know, we have to figure out kind of a plan B because uh, our picnic that we've held for over 40 years um, was this weekend and uh, we canceled that. Um, it's one of the larger events actually in the Northwoods. We see thousands of people coming through, but there's just no way with social distancing and everybody kind of being on edge and some of the backlash that we saw with some of the other events that were not fire department related up here. Um, it was just wasn't the right decision to make. And uh, we uh, decided to cancel that, but uh, in lieu of that, we're going online. Uh, we're still running some of our cash raffles. We're still going to be going out and looking at doing some things this fall with some of the other raffle items that we're going to get and try to get a little bit more creative through social media to do that. Um, we were very fortunate uh, at the beginning of all this that we applied for uh, the Gary Sinise Foundation and we were awarded one of their grants. So that kind of helped offset a lot of the required stuff that we needed, whether it be the N95s or extra gloves or gowns or things like that. So we're very fortunate that we were able to kind of help offset that. And even if we had to wait a little bit longer to get some of that and kind of piecemeal it together, um, you know, we were at a reusable state where we were trying to reuse what we could. Um, we also finally received um, our uh, shipment of uh, our uh, SCBA um, filters as well. So now we've got those on uh, the engines so we can use those for not just COVID. We can uh, use them for other incidents as well. So again, it's trying to repurpose things and use them for more than just this COVID response. And uh, again, like Joe said, you know, if you look at this as a business, you got to bounce back. You got to think of something different. You got to keep pushing forward because at the end of the day, the calls keep coming and we have to respond. So we have to keep doing stuff. And if it takes a little bit more creative fundraising and doing a couple of different things, or maybe starting a tradition with something new, um, we're actually potentially looking at uh, doing something like with a drive through, uh, trying to keep people again, socially distanced, but still trying to interact with the community a little bit. And uh, we've been doing 
a little bit more online presence over the past couple of years with like our cash raffles that we do um, with our uh, uh, public information officer. She's done a great job of doing a, a live videos and updates and different things like that through our uh, Facebook page. And we've interfaced really well with the news media up here as well. And uh, we do guest spots here and there. So um, I think for us, it's going to be more of an easy transition because we're trying to get more, not technology dependent fully, but a little bit more 50 50 with it so that, you know, things like this, it's a little bit easier so that the public is looking online or looking at, you know, the, uh, the news to see it and see what's going on. And it's a little easier to do. I'm listening. I'm just making you make you, you say so many good things. I got to write them down. I'll talk uh, slower. <laughs> you got to talk really slow for me. Um, I'm going to go down a rabbit hole. Oh boy. Yeah. Well, it's the first time we've done this and I've said for two weeks, I won't go down rabbit hole. So what am I going to do? I'm going to dive in. Um, I, I'm just going to ask one question. Uh, and I really don't want an explanation. I just want a yes or a no. Do you have on your department, you use the word PIO. Do you have, is that an official position within your department? Yes. Perfect. We'll bring that up later. Not tonight. I'm back out of the hole. Um, great. That's great information. Uh, Keith, I saved you for last. Um, and I did that. I did that purposely. Um, because they said you should always save the best for last. <laughs> you know, I'm your biggest fan. So sure. Uh, you guys have um, a very, very successful golf outing every June. Um, everybody, it's packed every year. Uh, people love it. They enjoy it. I hear about it um, through my phone calls and conversations and, and, uh, the, the posts on Facebook and everything. I mean, very, very, you, do, you guys do a great job. That was canceled this year. Yes. What impact? How hard was it to make that decision? How did you come to the decision? And do you regret it? Um, it, was a, it was definitely a decision that had a lot of thought put into it. Um, you know, when that decision was made, there was still uh, uncertainty as to the... Um, you know, some of the aspects of COVID. So, uh, but we knew we had to make a decision early uh, to be sure that, uh, you know, it's safer at home order wasn't overturned until late May and our golf outing was mid June. So it was, you know, so it, it, that we were kind of up against a rock and a hard spot. So we made the decision to cancel it. It was tough. Um, you know, it definitely puts a hurt on our fundraising efforts. Uh, the good thing is, is that, uh, last year, we instituted a new fundraising, uh, and it was a sportsman's, bank, a sportsman's banquet, and it was extremely successful for us. And um, so what we're now up against is, do we cancel that? And, you know, we're going to have that discussion tomorrow night. Uh, but that's where the, what, what Joe did in Stoddard and the, you know, rethinking your approach to fundraising and Maybe we do something that's still connected with how that uh, or what that fundraiser was was about, but doing something online and and not bringing 200 people together and stuffing them in the fire station and that's not going to work today. And I don't believe we're going to be in a position in October to do that anyway. So uh, we're going to have that discussion tomorrow night. Uh, but Barnabelle's doing, you know, we have a at any one given time in our budget and we have a municipal budget. Uh, we are in the midst of, of different programs. Uh, I'm right now in hose replacement program, uh, some nozzle replacements, and uh, SCBA tanks. Uh, sometimes we're, you know, d depending on what year it is and where we're at, uh, we're trying to keep all the turnout gear within 10 years, so we're buying so many sets per year and, and making sure that we're, uh, we're doing that. Um, I can see a couple of those programs getting put on hold uh, for a year here and keeping some budget money back for uh, covering some of the unexpected expenses of COVID, but our unexpected expenses weren't that high either, maybe a couple thousand bucks. Um, and I do know that the municipalities all got routes to recovery money and uh, those, th that money can be used to help cover some of those expenses as well as their own, uh, if they're willing to do that. 
there's also FEMA. And in the state of Wisconsin, FEMA is uh, for the uh, end result at the, for the fire department would be a 12.5% cost uh, or match. Uh, Wisconsin picks up 12.5% and, and FEMA picks up 75%. And the uh, category of FEMA that, uh, that FEMA looks at in this, in this event and many others is, is a category called protective measures. So PPE uh, would fall within that uh, category for COVID. So definitely worth um, getting on the grants portal for FEMA and setting up a account, an account and submitting uh, what they call a request for public assistance and setting yourself up so that you can begin uh, getting some reimbursements back for your expenses. Um, and that's done on an individual agency level um, or an individual, I should say more on an individual municipality level. Um, the schools are kind of independent of everybody else, but for instance, Stoddard, the village of Stoddard could set up a, an account with FEMA and then Joel would submit his receipts and stuff through that account, that kind of thing. So I think there's a way for the fire departments to get a lot of their expenses recovered that were spent on COVID. It's got to be COVID related. Super. That's great information. And I'm probably going to come back to you on some of those topics in a, in a yeah. private conversation. Um, I have actually had um, a training captain I was talking to almost two months ago now. I guess it's, it's August. It was, it was June and uh, was talking about their fundraising event. Their, their specific event was a uh, steak feed that they had canceled. And I asked this captain, I, you know, we were talking about training stuff is why he actually called me and I got done with that. And I said, yeah, I saw your steak feed was, was canceled. I'm sorry to hear that. He said, but you know, how bad do you think you're going to take a hit on that? And he says, Oh, he says, we sent out a letter uh, saying we weren't having the steak feed, but you know, would accept any donations as that was our primary, uh, our primary donation thing. And he said they made more money than they've ever made. So, um, I told him, I, I warned him, I said, well, don't, don't get too comfortable. I said, there, there may be a COVID giving effect with that. Um, but, uh, got some noise on back feet coming in, but, um, you know, I think that with the, with those events and I think it's good, it's, it's not surprising to me that we've reinvented ourselves and found different ways to get things done. Uh, we're the American fire service. We do that every day. Um, but I think that we also in, in the, in the, in, we have a history of getting blinders and, and, you know, they talk about, you know, running into the fire, not doing your size up and only seeing one side. And I think that as leaders, we have to remember that when we change these things, there's always a cause and effect. And you could do a gun raffle online in replacement of, say, the event like you, you typically hold, Keith, over there in Iowa County. But you have to understand that if, if, if I'm into guns, I'll throw you a $20 bill for a ticket, uh, especially, if I think I'm, especially if I'm doing it more to support the, the organization than, I, than it is about the gun or, or the, the, whatever it is you're raffling. But most of those people that are going are going for the social aspects of the event. There are people that they go to those with. I mean, it's just like card club. These four people go to every one of those events together, or they go to this event every year together, or they buy a table, a table of six or eight or whatever it is. I'm sure, I'm sure you can attest to that, Keith, that you guys have regular groups that buy a table every year and have for many years. Yeah. Um, and the fear is that 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 so that that social event, that steak feed, that pancake breakfast, that raffle, uh, uh, game raffle, whatever you want to call it, sportsman's raffle. I'm sorry. Those are important for those people from a social aspect, um, and and that, and that's why they come and they spend their money and what they get out of that is the social, it's kind of a trifecta. They get the social side, they get to give their money to a cause they believe in with 
the chance of getting something that they enjoy back, right. Be it a gun or something Mm -hmm. for us as, as a fire department, that is a rare opportunity for us to, dare I say, schmooze our constituents to talk about topics that maybe we want to drop a little hint or something about, eh, could really use some support on that new pumper um, coming up or man, I got a, I got some real opposition coming on uh, my budget and I, you know, the guys have been working hard and they're working in 40 year old gear and nobody wants to buy a new gear. I mean, how would you feel? You know? And I mean, there's a, there's an opportunity, you know, call it schmooze, call it inform, call it educate, call it politic. I don't care what you call it. It's, it's at the end of the day, we're trying to connect with the people that support us and, 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 and ask for their continued support. So um, we don't get that opportunity, at least not on a personal level. Um, And I've been in sales uh, in case you can't tell, I've been in sales for 30 plus years. And I know that if I'm talking to a customer on a phone It's a lot easier for him or her to say no to me than if I'm sitting across the table face to face. Um, The relationship and the conversation is just so much more real when it's that way. So um, again, I think it's great that we're doing what we're doing and we're acting how we are, but as we move forward, as, as we overcome this pandemic um, and, and I say when, because I believe we will, um, we need to take the same measures and, and, and evaluate what we've done and what will we revert back to and what will we say is now part of our history. Um, I'm sure you don't have many people saying I'm laying at wake at night because that we canceled that fundraising event. Um, but on the other hand, there's probably a lot of people that are saying, I really enjoyed that event. <laughs> so once they get past the whole work of it, you know, I don't know. Um, maybe our law enforcement brothers and sisters, I'm sure that they're doing a lot of fundraising. Could They could share some of their ideas with us because um, I know that they have to raise all their money too, like we do. So um, thanks for, I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. A little sarcasm. <laughs> You know, you got to have a lighter side of it, right? Right. Um, So thanks. Uh, I want to end. Any final comments? I'll I'll start back with you, Mike. Uh, I'll give you 30 seconds for any final comments. Um, I I like the one thing that you said with blinders on. I'm just telling everybody who's going out there in Vilas County, we have had all these problems that got swept under the rug. And whether it's suicides, opiate overdose, alcoholism, all those are skyrocketing by us. So you know, while COVID's a serious problem, keep your head on a swivel and watch for it because we still have skyrocketing numbers up here and we're still one of the leading counties in the whole entire state per capita with some of these deaths. And, you know, take care of your neighbors. Just keep caring about what you're doing on the calls. Try to make a difference and do what you can. And uh, don't put the COVID blinders on and just think that that's our only problem because we still have all these other problems going on. And uh, just keep going out there and keep making a difference. Keith? Oh, that was great, Mike, because that just gave me, you know, um, mental health uh, huge right now. And uh, whether it's uh, uh, your, your crews or if it's people just out in the community, I don't know that we can stress anymore the importance of self-care and taking care of your own, yourself as a chief or, or whatever it is and just not letting the stressors take over your life. Um, so I, I would encourage all departments to pay, pay attention to mental health for your membership and um, heck, get a hold of a local uh, mental health professional and have them chime in on a Zoom meeting. Give them 15 minutes. Just give them 15 minutes and have them give you some pointers on, on how to take care of yourself. And uh, I think it would be really beneficial for, for everybody to do that. Joe? Well, without echoing everything that, that – uh... Mike and Keith have stated that they're 100 percent on the mark, and I, the only thing that I would would do is, <clears throat> as these things are coming up, as challenges are coming up, um, don't just take the first uh, comment that is that is thrown us at as as the gospel. Uh, research it a little bit. Make sure that the information that we are getting is coming from a sourceable party, and uh, make educated decisions that are bettering you, your department, 
your firefighters, and your community. Um, and ultimately, as long as you have um, their best interests in, in mind, uh, you're not going to be making a wrong decision. And uh, that's the thing that you just need to put in your back pocket that uh, um, keep making those changes and keep everybody safe and we can keep moving forward on this. Yes. Um, I don't think we've seen the worst of it. Uh, I don't think we've seen the worst of it from a COVID standpoint. And <clears throat> as, as Mike was talking about the mental health, um, especially in our communities, uh, I definitely don't think we've seen the worst of that. Uh, I think people have to remember a, a couple of things and, and just, just a personal opinion. But for the last four months, um, a lot of people have been propped up by, by government money. And when that government money changes, which it sounds like it's going to significantly, um, people are going to start feeling, uh, especially people that, you know, I'm specifically talking about people that are out of work. Um, they're going to have to make some difficult choices as, as what funds they have run out. And that's, that's going to lead to, to real problems, uh, you know, with the alcohol and the drugs and stuff like that as, as they're going to start to feel like they don't have options. So um, I think that that's an issue. Uh, and then as far as COVID goes, I don't think we've seen the worst of that uh, for the simple reason people have to realize what's, what is one of the most difficult times for depression and things like that in Wisconsin? It's yeah. winter. And, and winter was over for the most part when COVID hit. Um, we got out of winter really early this year in comparison to most years. So COVID's going to come. It's going to take us through a full winter. Um, the other thing that we didn't have is we were out of flu season. So now you're gonna have flu season on top of it. Um, so I think we've got, uh, I, I don't wanna be doom and gloom, that's not me and you guys know that. But I also try to be a realist and say, you know, as you're sitting down is in, in our, I'm gonna call them Joe meetings, where we say, what are we gonna do and what does it look like? Um, we need, these are the future, these are the questions we should be asking. You know, if this turns out to be a really, really bad flu season, uh, that's going to add to, you know, if we're doing any EMS, that's going to add to our calls. Um, you know, if we have a breakout in schools, it's going to add to our call, you know. So those are questions for, for, for different meetings and different times. I just bring it up because I think um, it, it feels like we've been in COVID for like 10 years. Uh, <laughs> and and it's it's been what, what, April, May, June. We're not quite done with July. So four and a half months, I think it was mid-March is when the stay at home order came. Um, and it was, uh, for, for us, wasn't, I, th I think it was uh, St. Patrick's Day. Um, so the 15th, 16th, 17th, something like that. So um, it hasn't, you know, we've been through a lot and it ain't been that long. And, you know, I tell people all the time, they're like, nobody knows what they're doing and the opinions are different. And I said, you gotta understand, p these scientists, these experts, and I couldn't agree with you more, Joe, you have to listen to the experts and you have to trust them. And people are like, well, they don't even know what they're doing. And I'm like, this is the first time in the game. They're learning every single day, every test that's done, every scientist experiment, everything they analyze is giving them new information. And I'll put it back. I'll bring this full circle back into, you know, a fire chief's uh, point of view. When you go into a fire, you go to a working fire, and you set up your tactics and you say, we're going to go uh, offensive operation on this and things start to get ugly. And you realize that that interior crew is not winning the battle. You pull them out. Right. And you go to a defensive tactic because you now have more information, better information, and you change your tactics and your strategies. And I don't think that's any difference in, in the scientific community as they get new and better information, they change their strategy and their tactics. And sometimes that's saying, what I said before isn't accurate anymore. Um, and I think that that's really the, where we got to go here in the fire service. So thank you everyone for coming, uh, uh, for joining us. Please spread the word, Mike, Joe, uh, Keith. Uh, I, can't, I can't say enough how much it means to me that you are able to, to join me and, and willing to spend your time and, and go live and, and help get this thing kicked off. Please let your members know Please share it in your fire communities. 
Uh, I've got a number of topics already written down. If you've got other topics offline that you want to share, whether it be today, tomorrow, or down the road, um, and especially if you think that there's somebody out there I should bring on. Um, if you've got a topic and you know somebody that's a subject expert, um, they don't need to have rank. This is an open community. Uh, I got a lot of firefighters that are smarter than me. So um, I don't care what color your helmet is. As long as you bring something to the table and can communicate it, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in. I'm game. So uh, for those that missed it in the beginning, uh, announcement this weekend, we're going to bring a short mini class out next week. That'll be on the same channel. Look for that announcement and please join us. Um, until next time, probably a month or so, the next roll call, uh, look for announcements on that and we'll be in touch. Until then, be safe, take care of yourself, take care of one another. <laughs>